Hello and welcome to our inverse function discussion where we look, and this is part four, where we look at how this applies to trig. Specifically, we're going to apply the inverse function to the sine wave, the sine function, the cosine, and the tangent function. Now, a lot of what we do here just directly carries from all of our previous discussion with inverses. And perhaps the most interesting aspect of this whole piece is that, well, when you look at these waves, they're not one-to-one -one functions. So here's me drawing the sine wave. This would be pi radians, 2 pi. Let's make this pi over 2, negative pi over 2, negative pi. And, oh boy, this is, I should have just graphed it out. Okay, we got this, we got this. Here we go. Negative pi over 2 negative pi, negative 3 pi over 2, and negative 2 pi. And my spacing looks pretty good here. Okay, so our sine wave, what does it do? Well, let's just get a nice sketch of our sine wave. Start off at 0, and it's going to uh, vary between positive 1 and negative 1. We know that. So sine wave is going to climb and reach 1 eventually at pi over 2, 0, negative 1, and then back to zero. This is our sine wave here. And we're going to actually carry it through in this direction as well. So it's going to continue. Pardon the rough sketch. It's not one to one. In other words, if I said, okay, uh, the output of the sine wave, let's make it uh, zero. Well, which zero am I talking about? We're talking about pi radians at 2 pi, at 0, negative pi, negative 2 pi. You have no idea which input I'm, I'm referring to. So that's interesting, right? Does that just mean we stop there? Because the sine wave does not have an inverse function. Here's a graph of a sine wave. It's not 1 to 1. So we'll say f of x is the sine wave. Well, what we figured out is that what you could just do is cut the domain up in some way and then you can find the inverse. There are many ways to cut this up, but we want to include all of the full range, right? Every value from positive one through negative one. And it just turns out that it ends up being most convenient to cut it between negative pi over two radians here and positive pi over two radians. That's the domain of the sine function. Gets us this little piece right here. So when we work with our sine function, in all of our problems, we're assuming that the domain is cut where x is greater than or equal to negative pi over 2 and less than or equal to pi over 2. And you see something similar with cosine and tangent, but we're just finding ways to cut it up. And what the inverse is essentially doing, let's think about the inverse function for a moment here. The sine function itself, let's say this is a, our input, this is b, our output. The sine function is taking inputs, angle values, and mapping them to ratios here. That's what, that's what the sine function does. The inverse function takes those ratios and maps it back to given angles. Right? So you're given some ratio, you apply the inverse function on it, it's going to tell you the angle that has that ratio. So they give us a, a nice definition of this process here, and we're told that essentially uh, two things are happening. It's called that we're told that, uh, maybe I'll do it this way. Here's x. Here's y, right, x to y. First of all, f of x equals y. Therefore, the inverse function of y is x. So if we have the sine function here, we could say that the sine of x, that's f of x, equals y. And the, and the inverse function, the inverse of sine of y equals x. It's just going back and forth, right? And when we look at the inverse sine right here, we sometimes refer to it as the arc sine, and it's not equal to 1 over the sine. Be careful, right? You might see this negative 1 and think that, but that's not what it means. Now, another thing that starts to happen here is that we can apply the function inverse property to the sine function as well, and that's going to be important to understand. So let's just be clear about it. If we have, let's do two diagrams here. This is A and this is B in both cases. Here's A, here's B. Now from one perspective, 
let's say we're starting with uh, a, x here. We apply the sine function, which we'll call f. It's going to take x to f of x. And then we apply the inverse function, the arc sine. It's going to take you back to x here. And it's also true if we start over here with our input and apply the inverse first. Here's the inverse function. It's going to take you to the inverse of f of x. And then if you apply the function to the inverse, it takes you back where you started. This is that really beautiful function composition property. And here, the first one is showing us, well, we start with f, right? So we start with f of x, and then we plug that into, or we apply the inverse function to that, and we go back to x. So this means that the inverse sine function composed of the sine function equals x, and this is applying to, since we're starting with the sine, we're starting here in our domain, it has to be that you're picking x values or angle values. This is for all x that are bigger than or equal to negative pi over 2 and less than or equal to pi over 2 because we've constricted that domain of the sine function. We can only pick angles between there. Otherwise, it's not going to be one-to-one. -one. But in this one over here, we're starting, we started here x and our inverse function first. So we started with the inverse function, and then we ran that through the function f itself. And this got us back to x. But in terms of sine, it means that the inverse of sine of x, right, that's what we're starting with. If you take the sine and compose it of the inverse sine of x, then you get back to x. And this is restricted in a different way. And it's just referring to the way that this is all behaving. Because we're starting with the inverse here now, and not the sine itself, and we're starting in b, our x values are restricted between negative 1 and positive 1. Because the original outputs of the sine between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 are between negative 1 and 1, but the inverse starts where the range of the original function was. It starts between negative 1 and positive 1. So these properties are true, but they're only true for these x values here. And we want to be careful. If our angles are not between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, we want to find coterminal angles that are. If our x values are not between negative 1 and 1, it's, I think, certainly possible that it's not even um, solvable because there, the, we have to get outputs between negative 1 and positive 1, for example. And that leads us to a sketch of the graph of the sine function. Let's go back here. So this is um, the little segment we're looking at, the function itself. What does the inverse of that look like? So it's going to be a rough sketch, but I guess we can do it. Let's do it side by side with the sine function so you can see how this is quickly generated. So here we'll sketch out the inverse function. And here we have the sine wave. Okay, so the sine wave itself is going between negative pi over 2 up to positive pi over 2, and it's fluctuating between an output of 1 and negative 1. 1 and negative 1. And it's starting here at negative pi over 2, it's going to be at negative 1. A positive pi over 2 is going to be at positive 1. And right in the middle here is going to be at 0, something like this. So when we go from a function to its inverse, we reverse the x and the y values. So these are our original three points. And that means that in the inverse function, we're going to swap those. And if it's hard to think about what that will look like, as it often is for me, just remember it's going to be reflected across the line y equals x. So it's got to be something right like, like that. right? And here, though I'm, this is probably not going to be at all a scale, it's not exactly the scale, of course, but we're going to go find the point 1 and then pi over 2, which is a little bit above 1.5, right? So it's going to be 1. Here's 1. And let's make our 1s at the same height so it looks good for you here. Okay, here's 1. So here's 1. And here's 2. All right, so sorry. This is 1 and comma pi over 2, so it's probably about, about here. 1 and then pi over 2. 0, 0 is still where it was. 
and then we go to negative 1, we're reversing this point now, negative pi over 2. That's probably about here. Negative 1, negative pi over 2. And the curvature goes something like this, and that's our inverse function. So we're dealing with, <laughs> we are dealing with this shape right here, roughly drawn. And they're all types of interesting problems we can look at. Uh, I'll just show you one of them. I guess uh, should I show you? Well, and if you in the textbook, you'll see um, how this applies to the unit circle. But basically, on the unit circle, remember. Let me just say it really rough sketch real quick. This becomes important. In the unit circle, we'll leave out all the angle values for a moment. The domain of the inverse, the uh, domain of the sine function that we're restricting it to, is between negative pi over two and pi over two. So we're looking at this region here. That's what we're looking at in all of our calculations. And beyond that, we get some problems like this. Let's say we had um, the cosine of the inverse sine of 4 over 5. There's some really cool ways to solve this problem, but let's just keep track of what this is even saying. This is saying that there's some angle. And if you take the sine of the angle, you get 4 fifths. And we want to find the cosine of the angle that has a sine of 4 fifths. You want to find the cosine of the angle that has a sine of 4 fifths. So you can actually always draw triangles to solve these kind of problems. Let's think about this for a moment. There's some angle, call it theta, and the sine of that angle, when you find it, you get 4 fifths, and that's 4 over 5, opposite over hypotenuse. And if we use the Pythagorean theorem, this is a 3, 4, 5 triangle, and we can quickly assess that the cosine of this angle, which is adjacent over hypotenuse, or 3 fifths, is right there. And that's the answer. What's nice about this is that we can now say, well, what's the tangent of the inverse sine of 4 fifths? Well, in this case, it would be opposite over adjacent, so it would be 4 thirds, and so on and, and so forth. You can look at all the different ratios, right? Secant you can look at, which is the reciprocal of the cosine. Be five thirds cosecant reciprocal of the sine five fourths cotangent reciprocal of the co the t tangent which would be three fourths so on and so forth. Another way to solve it that is an interesting algorithm uh, that might not be necessary here, but is certainly beautiful in its own right, reminds us of certain properties and is applicable in other problems, is to use a little bit of algebraic thinking and wishful thinking as well, because when we look at this right here. I mean, I say to myself, wow, this is really confusing. It wouldn't be so confusing if it was this, the sine of the inverse sine of 4 fifths, right? If it was this, that would be great. The answer would just be 4 fifths because the sine of its inverse of whatever value we're looking at is just that value. It's just x, right? That's that, that function inverse property. So my question is, how can we get to this? If we have the cosine of the inverse sine, is there some way to write cosine in terms of sine? Well, the answer is yes. We can write the cosine in terms of sine using the Pythagorean identity. If you remember, the sine squared of an angle plus the cosine squared of an angle, this is the Pythagorean theorem, so in a way equals one, it equals 1 is somehow correlated to this thinking right here. If that's true, then if we solve for the cosine, we get the cosine of theta equals 1, the square root, uh, positive or negative square root of 1 minus the sine squared of theta. So there is a way to do that. So we have our theta right here is this angle, the inverse sine of 4 fifths, right? That's what our theta is. So we're going to rewrite that as the positive or negative square root of 1 minus the sine squared, and this is our theta, this is the angle that gives us a sine of 4 fifths. Now, what's interesting about a problem like this is that we've got it set up. Which square root do we take? Well, remember that we're constraining ourselves between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. And also remember that we're looking for the cosine. The cosine is the x value of any terminal point along the unit circle here. So in all of these angles, what do you know about the x values of all these points? All of these points, whether they're above the x-axis or below, have positive x-values, right? They're to the right of the y-axis. So that means that in, we're looking at inverse sines, since we're constrained between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 for our angles, 
it has to only be positive cosines because the cosine of any of those values is positive. So we can ignore the negative. It's not possible to get a negative cosine from the inverse sine. Now, how do we deal with this piece over here? The, what, what do we do? Well, this little piece right here is the sine squared of the inverse sine of 4 fifths. So it's kind of like saying, well, it's, it's not kind of like saying, it is saying that you have the sine of the inverse sine of 4 fifths, which is just 4 fifths, and then that whole thing is being squared. So that's just saying 4 fifths squared. And what does that mean? Well, we have 1 minus 4 fifths squared is 16 20 fifths. And 1 minus 16 20 fifths is 25 20 fifths minus 16 20 fifths, which is 25 minus 16 is 9. And it's 20 fifths. And the square root of 9 20 fifths, the square root of 9 is 3. The square root of 25 is 5, and that's the same answer we got before. The cosine of the inverse sine of 4 fifths is 3 fifths. Now that's how it works for sine. We're going to quickly run through cosine and tangent, and then I encourage you to look through and try all sorts of practice problems. There's so many great things that we can look at. Now the cosine function, um, what, what should we say real quick? Well, we should say that we cut the domain in a different way. And it's not actually meant to be, it's not random, I should say, and it's not meant to confuse you. We cut these domains up in different ways so that all of this work works nicely together. It comes together in a really wonderful way. So because we cut it up in these distinct ways, everything works really well. If we cut it up in different ways, it wouldn't work so nicely. And furthermore, you know, if you look at the cosine wave, it's going to drop off like this where the intersection point is pi over 2 and negative pi over 2, we couldn't cut it in the same way because if we only cut it between negative pi over, over 2 and positive pi over 2, we'd only be getting the positive values up here of cosine. What about all these negative values in there? We can't ignore those. So the way we choose to cut it up, the way that we choose to cut it up is between 0 and pi. So this is, oh, this is not, come on, Sean, we can do better. This is meant to go down at pi. At pi radians, that's at 180 degrees. Your x value is 0. So assume I do that symmetrically. Ignore this part over here. Um, we cut it up between 0 and pi radians. right? So here, this is the point 0, 1. This is pi over 2, 0. That's really sloppy, sorry. And right here, this is pi negative 1. So for cosine, um, the cosine function now, f is, of x is the cosine function. We cut up our domain between 0 and pi radians. So on the unit circle, that means that if we're ever interacting with sine, kind of like in the last problem with the inverses, it's really nice here because the, the unit circle, when we're cutting our, our angles between 0 and pi radians here, all the sine values are positive. All those heights have, remember the sine is, is the y value of these terminal points. All of those sines of the y values, they're all positive. That's going to be really cool and helpful in a lot of problems. So we cut it up in this way. And if you look at the inverse definitions for cosine and all that, it all corresponds to the fact that the cosine domain is between 0 and pi and the outputs are between negative 1 and positive 1. And that just means that the inverse cosine can only give you angles between 0 and pi, which is why we look at this region of the unit circle. Finally, we look at tangent. Now, what tangent does is also... Tangent, tangent I always find fascinating. Um, the tangent function, if you remember, it cycles in a different way. It doesn't take two pi radians to complete it full cycle. It takes pi radians. And if we draw an asymptote at negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, that reminds us that the tangent function fluctuates between negative infinity and positive infinity between those two asymptotes. And it's nice to get some friendly points in there. This is really abstract, but this is the point 0, 0. Halfway here hits 1, so pi over 2 is going to hit 1. A negative pi over 2 is going to hit negative 1, right? So this is the tangent function. And we actually, just like with the sine function, 
our domain for the tangent is between, so if f of x is the tangent function, our domain is between these asymptotes. It's between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, which corresponds to the sine function. And when we graph the inverse tangent, we are going to reverse the y's and the x's. So you can imagine maybe if we, if we drew the line y equals x, right? And we try to reflect this, try to imagine what that would look like, and then take a look at the book and see and see what it looks like. Or draw it out for yourself, reverse these points, and you'll get a picture of how this works. But what's really interesting is since the range of the tangent function is not constrained here, it goes from positive infinity to negative infinity, that is the domain of the inverse, right? The domains and the ranges swap. So the domain of the inverse is any number you want to plug, any real number, because that's the range of the tangent function. And there are all sorts of lovely things to discover like this, so I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much.